Good morning, and let me share with you something interesting. Proverbs 11.30, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. He that with his souls is wise. You know, I grew up in a Baptist church, fundamentalist Baptist church, and went to a fundamentalist Bible college for a couple of years, and Moody Bible Institute for another three years, and um, I constantly heard the term soul winning. Over and over it would be used. And this verse in Proverbs, they would continually quote it. He that win it souls his lies. Because that was a big thing among Baptists and the fundamentalists and those in Bible colleges to go out, you know, soul winning. Uh, they didn't say witnessing, they didn't say evangelizing, they said soul winning because you're winning souls. You know, what always got me about fundamentalists uh, was that we were very quick to criticize these Pentecostals and Charismatics because they took verses out of context. And yet, when I started reading Proverbs, I got to realize, you know, I don't know if they're really using the right context when they say witnessing and leading people to the Lord is soul winning. Now, that may be a good expression, but... Um, to quote this verse as an evangelistic verse might not be. You see, the word win in Hebrew is lakha. And lakha has the idea of taking possession. In fact, it's the word that um, is used when a man is going to get married in Judaism. And he says, I have taken myself a bride. It's that word taken. It's to take, and it's got the idea of taking possession of and taking control of. Um, and he, so it's not so much winning as it's you're taking possession, you're taking control of something, you're, you're taking, you know, you're bringing something under your, more of the idea of you're bringing something under your protection, your control, you know, something that you uh, almost possess or own. I know that doesn't sound good possessing, you know, a man possessing his wife. Uh, and that really isn't the idea, but it's more of, you know, having a sense of control over something. And then the word souls is nephish, which has a wide range of meaning. And one meaning is to its fleshly desires. Uh, nephish is a reference to that part of you that's uh, your mind, your thinking process, your emotions. And so really, if you want to translate this in a way, it could read not so much he that winneth souls is wise, but he that takes possession or control of his fleshly desires is wise. Uh, and there's a story, you know, Jesus quoted a verse, or Jesus said in Matthew 16, 19 to 21, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and dust doth corrupt, where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where thieves do not break through or steal, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now what does that have to do with Proverbs? This. About 47 years before Jesus was born, there was a, and this is a true story, I read this in uh, Jewish literature, um, there was a Jewish settlement in the area which is now Kurdish Iraq, and it was caught up in the middle of a war, a campaign between the Romans and the Parthians. And this little Jewish kingdom uh, just got devastated. The kingdom was known as Abedin. Abedin uh, was up to that time a very prosperous little kingdom. You know, they were, the, they were the focus of trade and commerce and were very, it was a very wealthy kingdom. And uh, the king, uh, as with most kings, he was in line of secession. His ancestors had built up a, a huge treasury and first century Jews uh, were very familiar with this little kingdom because of the generosity of this kingdom towards Judah 
and the temple. They gave much wealth, uh, brought up much wealth for the nation of Judah and for the temple. Well, what happened when this war broke out between the Romans and the Parthians, um, this little kingdom got devastated. I mean, stripped clean. And, you know, the people were, of the kingdom were going hungry, were starving. So what the king, Monobaz, uh, the just Jewish king did, was go to the treasuries that had been built up through generations of his ancestors, and he emptied the treasuries, spent practically every dime in that treasury, or every uh, shekel in that treasury, I guess, every piece of gold, in order to feed his people in the kingdom. Well, some of the people in Judah sent a rather nasty letter to King Monobaz and said, you know, what are you doing? Your ancestors spent generations building this wealth and now you've spent it all on your people. Uh, just, you know, to feed your people. Uh, you know, is that any way to treat the wealth that's been stored up? And King Monobaz wrote back to these leaders in Judea and this is what he said. Um, well, what he said was, my ancestors accumulated wealth here on earth, but I have stored up treasures in heaven. They stored up treasures in a place where a thief's hand could never break in. Or, that. <laughs> let me get his quote right here. My ancestors accumulated wealth uh, for here on earth, but I have stored up treasures in heaven. They stored up treasures in a place over which the hand of the thief can break, break in. But I have stored up treasures in a place where a thief's hand can never break in. My ancestors stored up treasures which bear no fruit. I have stored up treasures where interest accumulates and bears much fruit. My ancestors stored up treasures of money, but I have stored up treasures of souls which is taught in scripture, the fruit of the righteous is the tree of life, and he that with its souls is wise. And then, just 47 years later, this story, which was very well known throughout Judea, the people of Judea, Jesus comes along and he mentions, or says in Matthew 6, 19, 20, 19 to 21, lay up not treasures for yourself here on earth, where moth and dust corrupt, where thieves break through and steal. But lay up your treasures in heaven where thieves do not break through and steal. For where your treasure is, there is where your heart. You know, he was obviously making a direct reference to King Monobaz. And the fact that King Monobaz had, a, had heavenly thoughts, not earthly thoughts. That the wealth that was there it could have just sat there and you did nothing with it. Or now in the time of great need, that's what his ancestors were putting the wealth up for. That was the reason it was there for those times when others were in need and then he shared it. Because his treasure was really in heaven. And the earthly treasure, that wasn't important. You know, I've noticed as I get older, um, you know, I finally reached that magical age of 70. You know, money isn't as important as it was. Um, it, it's not that really important to me. You know, as long as I got a roof over my head, and, you know, I got some food in the refrigerator and something on the shelves, I, I'm quite happy. You know, I, I, I'm not out to, you know... <laughs> You get to this age, you're not trying to dress up fancy to impress people. You're not trying to put on, you know, your best, uh, wear the best clothes so you can turn the heads of young women. I, I have no interest in turning the heads of young women anymore. Um, you know, things change as you get older. And so you see life much differently because you know life's going to end. Uh, you begin to realize your mortality start stepping forward. And once you realize your mortality, your mind starts to turn to eternal things. I had a 
woman on the bus yesterday who was uh, 72, and she says, oh man, I didn't even realize I turned 72. Uh, and she was just horrified at her age. Uh, because, well, her mind was on earthly things. And she realized the earthly things was going to end before long. But as you get older and you realize your mortality, your mind turns to heavenly things. And so he that winneth souls is wise is really saying he that's able to control his own soul, he that's able to seize and take possession of his own fleshly desires, he's the one that's wise. He's not going to let his fleshly desires dictate his life. He's going to keep his mind stayed on God, stayed on eternal things. Well, I guess I got to thinking about that, and I, you know, kind of grew critical of my heritage, fundamentalist heritage and evangelism that I grew up in. And I realized maybe they weren't too far off from the context. He that went at souls is wise, because you know, being an Aspie, you know, having Asperger syndrome, uh, I would have really isolated myself. Uh, but you know, it was the emphasis on evangelism, the emphasis on witnessing, going out, passing out tracts, talking to strangers, and inviting them to accept Jesus as their, as their Savior. Man, that was hard. That took a lot of courage, especially for someone like me. And I just remembered a fear and torment I went through, but I felt obligated to do it. This is what they told me God wanted me to do, and I wanted to do what God wanted me to do. And you know all that time what I was doing? I was taking control of my soul. I was taking control of my fleshly desires, the fleshly desires that said, don't make a fool of yourself. Don't embarrass yourself in front of everybody. You just serve God and not care what anybody thinks. And, you know, that's a whole lot easier now as you get older because <laughs> the older you get, who cares what you think? Um, you know, and, you know, who cares if everybody has to look at this uh, old grizzly mug on Facebook? Uh, and I realize that evangelism did more than all the other things I've done in my life to overcome my Asperger's, uh, to control, you know, this um, Asperger's uh, syndrome that was, you know, would have kept me isolated. Uh, and I think for many others too, personal evangelism was something that really brought them out of their shell. Uh, I found <laughs> I found even recruiters for cold called sales were contacting me because if anybody's got the guts to go out and tell someone except Jesus their savior, they surely got enough guts to sell life insurance or something doing cold calling. Um, not everybody can do that. The only ones that can do it are those who can take control their fleshly desires, which, you know, I want you to, <laughs> your fleshly desires tell you, don't make a fool of yourself. Make sure that you're accepted by everybody. But you know, Jesus said the world's going to hate you for me. They're, they're going to want to put you to death for my sake. You know, which is going to come first, your personal gizzard or Jesus Christ? And I admit, I can talk because, you know, as I said, as you get older, <laughs> it's getting easier and easier to put that old flesh under control. And it's easier and easier to keep your mind stayed on God because, you know, you know, time is getting short and your mind does turn to heavenly things. So I got an advantage over you young folk. <laughs> it's a lot easier for me. But someone who's been through it, let me tell you, you start early in life controlling your fleshly desires. That's going to be a real key to your success in the future. And that's going to be one way that God's going to prosper you. 
But keep in mind, the real key, he that would its souls is wise, he that's able to control his personal desires and become like King Manabak and not be that concerned about building your wealth on earth, laying up your treasures here on earth because this is only temporal. Before long, you're going to face eternity and the treasures you laid up there. And the way to do that is just always remember Jesus is right there by your side. He's with you every moment, every second. And whatever you do, do is unto him.